I can't believe I'm about to say this, but after 15 seasons, this season of the Rick Mercer Report will be the last. I'm not sure you can believe it either. I can't really. No. It was a decision I made, and I certainly made it public, so that would ensure (laughs) that it was real. I just left St. John's just last week, and I was at the airport, and I was in security, and the guy had my laptop, so I couldn't really get away from him. And he said, you're leaving the show. I said, yeah. He said, worst mistake you've ever made. (laughs) And I said, well, you never know. And he said, oh, no, you're going to regret this. And then he kind of looked around to strangers as if nodding, as if they would agree. And then there was a woman behind me, and she was like, yeah, no, he's right. Yeah. So I don't know. It's 15 years. I just figured it was time. Rick's here in the Q studio to look back on what he calls the best job ever. Why, why now? Why is it time? I just thought that 15 years is a very long run. We're lucky in the sense that uh, the Mercer Report sticks its toes into current affairs and news and generally shows that last longer than five or six seasons are current affairs and news. But we're not. We're a comedy show. Right. And 15 years is a, is a super long run. And I just feel like it's time to do something else, except I don't know what that something else is. Was there a moment? Was there like a long walk in the in the snow? No. No, there was nothing like that at all, actually. It's been it's kind of been on my mind for a while. I I've done this before. I left the best job in television once before when I left twenty two minutes. I was gonna ask you about this because like it seems to be a bit of a trend here. Like you you seem to know when it's time for you to go rather than someone telling you? Because you, le- you left 22 minutes at a, at, at a major After peak After eight show. years, and I felt like I was there for five minutes. And yeah. I really believed at the time it was the best job in TV. And, uh, and it was in many ways. But it led to the Mercer Report. And I didn't really know if that would work out or not. And it was successful beyond my wildest dreams. So I just think it's time to do something. Do and get- maybe I'm a little old to be jumping out of planes every week. Yeah, maybe. Just a little bit. I don't think so. Uh, no, do you ever get? We're padding. Do you ever get nervous about leaving? Is there ever part of you that's like, I don't know about this? Only around three and four a.m. Really? That's when I get a little nervous. I guess I'm uh, I'm in a fortunate position that uh, when I left Twenty Two Minutes, I, I had to find a job. I mean, I've got to get a job. I guess. I guess I got to do something, and I'll want to do something because uh, I think I'm an active guy. Mm -hmm. So I'm nervous, but I'm also excited because I would never complain about my current job, but it is all-encompassing. So there's many, many things over the years that I might have tried, but I just couldn't because I was tied up doing something else. Like what? What you, what, I, I don't know things. You I don't know. know. People I, I, say, I, I, "Hey, would you like to try?" You know, would you like? Would, would you like to do radio? Mm-hmm. I would love to do radio, mm-hmm. but I can't. I've got this TV show I'm doing. All right. Would you like to come work on this series? Sure. You know, that right. would be fun. Except I'm doing this TV show. Rick, would you, you like to sell real estate? Rick, if you're taking my job, you got to let me know. I'm not. You got to. You got. You, you, like it's, it's. This is it's, not it's an a, entry level radio <laughs> position. This is the biggest. This is as big as it gets. You've peaked. You're like Napoleon. No, you're going to sit down at 35 or whatever and weep because there's no more worlds to conquer. I'm. I'm done. I don't know how old he was when he wept. Anyway. Well, maybe around my age. Um. Why, why is it? Well, when you're making the show right now. And you're looking around, and you have the show tonight with Jan Arden. Yep. When you're looking around the set, are you doing a little bit of, oh, geez, this is the last, this is the last time I'll do this? I'm not there yet because I still have 15 odd shows ahead of me and an hour best of, but I feel like that every week. Like I can count on one hand the number of times when I walk out on stage in front of my studio audience where I haven't been in the mood. And that's after 15 years. Like, I, I love the studio. I love the live audience. I love going out on the road. I love e- almost every part of my show mm-hmm. I like doing. So, yes, it's bittersweet in a way, but it's also it's so all-encompassing I haven't really thought about it. Maybe because I'm a man, I've decided not to think about these things mm-hmm. and just... Just push it away. Just get get, get it out Just of the way. Push that away, right? And I'll deal with that some other time. That's some real Newfoundland stuff. Well, there I don't too, want to sit know? around and. Wonder about the future? That's real Newfoundland. That's real. Well, I think well, that's, I'm just, go I think and do that's it. A, just a thing yeah. that people do. What yeah. do you, I'm not one to sit around and contemplate. You're going to have to soon, aren't you? You're like Buddy at Security now. What are you going to do? <laughs> you're going to have to contemplate. <laughs> All right. Well, tell me about the Buddy at Security. So, like, when you're you love this country, you travel this country an awful lot. You 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 must be constantly just packing and unpacking and on the road. Uh, I haven't unpacked in about the 15 years. I'm I mean, you know, there's like three different bags, uh, various levels of winter yeah. because we shoot a lot in the winter. So I've got the heavy Arctic in there and I've got the, just the medium winter and then I've got the balmy. I've got it. Yeah. I'm just, I'm never really unpacked. And I want you to tell me this story uh, about being on a plane and you realizing 
that your life is a bucket list? Oh, I was on a plane with a guy, and uh, I, I'm actually, I'll have to keep doing something because I'm the type of person who will chat next to the person oh, on the yeah. plane. I love you. I don't mind. I don't <laughs> mind. And, uh, but this guy told me, and he, ju- he just told me that he had, uh, it, something had happened. He had a near-death experience, and he also believed that he didn't have much time left. And I don't know if he actually had a limited amount of time or this was just uh, – he was just informed by his near-death experience. But he actually had a bucket list, and he was actually – had retired. He had cashed out. He was working through his bucket list before he died. And I'd never met anyone who had ever done this. I mean, it's a plot in a movie, mm-hmm. sure. But – and then he started – Telling things that telling me things he wanted to do before he died. Like what? Every single thing. I was like, oh, you've got to do that. Like oh, what? I've like done what? that. It's great. Oh, you've got to do that. Oh, it was, it was, you know, climb a mountain. It was jump out of an airplane. It was try to fly with the snowbirds. It was try, you know, it was like stand atop of the the Parliament Hill right. and change the flag. It was it was a ton of and, and it was like it was like he had a Wikipedia of my episodic printout there. And I eventually stopped saying, Oh, you've got to do that. It's great, because I thought, what a like, I've actually lived this guy's bucket list. And it's not my bucket list, by the way. A lot of these things aren't on my bucket list at all, but they're always on someone else's bucket list. What is on your bucket list? I don't really have one no? in that way. You know, my bucket list always was if I can make a living in show business. That was it. And that's what I'm the most proud of out of anything I've ever done. But now that you're now that you're done the Rick Mercer report, there's not. I'm not f- done yet. I've got fifty. I'm on tonight. <laughs> okay. I'm now not. That, <laughs> I'm, not <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on tonight. Me tonight, the, I'm still alive. Me and the National are on tonight. Eight o'clock. It's a prime time show. <laughs> but it's, it's a huge. But when yeah. but when when the time comes, <laughs> is, is there is there anything you you, you want to do? Is there anything on that bucket list? Anything you haven't had the chance to do? I know you I mean. Maybe you, now this yeah. will force me to do things because all of the things that I would like to do. It's not like my show stopped me. Like, I could say, like, well, you know, Tom, I wanted to write a great Canadian novel for many years, but the show is stopping me. Well, I guess I could have put pen to paper and got the first page down yeah, right. somewhere in the last 15 years. So, uh, you know, I wish I could, I could drop something on you that sounded really exciting, like a theme park or mm-hmm. Rick Mercer's <laughs> Lobster Boil. <laughs> You can come down, play some music. Oh, that'd be great. I'll host. Yeah. Tourists will come in. <laughs> They'll get a lobster. All you can eat mussels. It's great. We'll make a bundle. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, 15 years on the Rick Mercer Report. How has – I want to talk a little bit about the, the top of the show, the headlines, you know, the, the political satire portion of the show. How has doing political satire from the time you began, not even on 22, at the beginning, at the Rick Mercer sure. Report, to now, how has that changed? I think one thing that's happening – and you see this all over. Uh, there's an expression in Newfoundland, quick to hurt. Like certain people, they're just always, they're always looking to be offended. They're always looking to be uh, outraged about something, having their feelings hurt. And then it just gets a little tedious after a while. It's like, you're hurt again? Well, I think more and more people are quick to hurt now. You can't really say anything. Or whatever you say, there are going to be people who uh, have a platform because they have social media. And, uh, and they can inform you quickly that they're, they feel aggrieved, uh, aggrieved, but um, but they. It's just it's reached a point where people, I think, are worried about saying anything. So it's more difficult now to do political satire or any satire at all. I think. And has that changed the way you had to do comedy? It hasn't really changed the way that I work. And part of that reason is that I'm on at eight o'clock, and so I cover. I cover subject matters in a certain way, and I don't think that I run into this as much as other people do. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, as, as time goes on, you, it does change the way you work. And people have – people. You, you might also say that people have more of a voice than ever before. People yeah, who... in many ways it's a good thing, and, and especially when you're looking at communities that have always been overlooked or mm-hmm. marginalized, suddenly they have a voice, and I think that that is great. Except there is just a lot of people who are just constantly upset. Well, you, you probably have them on your Facebook. Mm-hmm. Like certain people are like, wow, you're upset again, eh? Once again, mm-hmm. again this morning, mm-hmm. completely outraged. I just call her mom. Yeah, that's yeah. a thing. <laughs> I'm only joking, Mom. I'm only kidding around. A lot of people know you from the rants, which cover topics from politics to pop culture, 
to one of your and my favorite targets. Take listen to this. Because when you move to Toronto, you realize pretty quick that when it comes to the weather, there are two parallel universes. There's what you hear about in the media, and then there's what you see out your window. You can wake up and turn on the news, and you can see a lead story about a snowstorm that slammed the city, how there were 300 accidents between 5 and 9 a.m., how no flights took off, and the reporter on the scene is so panicked, he sounds like he's reporting live from the bottom of a collapsed mine shaft. And you think, oh my God. I had no idea. Those poor people. But then you realize, hang on, I'm in Toronto. Then you look out the window, there's three centimeters of snow on the ground, and the kid across the street is walking his dog in his T-shirt. And you realize, there was no snowstorm. There was no weather bomb. There were flurries. That was a clip of Rick Mercer's rant about Torontonians and the weather on the Rick Mercer Report from back in 2008. How do you feel listening to that? Not much has changed, quite frankly, as we're <laughs> heading into the winter season. The great thing about the rant is, really, it is such a privilege because I have no mandate. I don't have to rant about what's happening in Ottawa this week. I can rant about what's bugging me when I walk down the street. I can rant about the weather. I can, I can talk about uh, uh, something that's just affected me that I know is not a funny uh, subject at all. I mean, you know, two weeks ago, I, I didn't so much rant as I used that opportunity to just tell a story about Gord Downey. And there was nothing ranty about it. It was just a simple story. And that's something I'm going to miss for sure because it's an amazing uh, privilege to be able to do that every single week. And you do it Thursday nights, right? All in your I own? Always tape, I always write them on Thursday night. It's a yeah. part of the show that I write entirely on my own because, it, well, it has to be. It's, it's entirely opinion-based. You can't, you can't uh, you know, present opinion in any kind of collective. Tell, tell me honestly, is there, a bit of a, is there a bit of a ritual around it? Do you, do, do you always have a drink or do you always listen to this? I or? always stay in my office in the CBC, and I actually don't spend a lot of time in the CBC. I'm always on the road, but uh, I can count on one hand the number of times I've written it anywhere other than my office. Yeah, so that's it. I go in there, and then I won't come out, and I won't go they, home. They know to leave you alone. They know to, There's no one there. Right. You know, it's, it's nighttime, and, uh, and I don't leave until it's done. So sometimes I'm done by 9 or 10 o'clock at night. That's great. And other times I've practically slept there. That's just the way it is. Sometimes it comes easy, and sometimes the opposite. Sometimes it feels like the rants gave you another life. I mean, for, for people like me who watched you on television, and a lot of people who watched you on television, you're like a TV guy. You've been, you've been on TV sure, for, yeah, a, long yeah, for a long time. For a long time. The rants were this part of the Rick Mercer report that just went viral. Every time they came out, they were shared on, on websites. They were shared on, mm -hmm. on Facebook. Is that, is that more meaningful to you when these things are shared online rather than on your TV show? Uh, well, it's completely new to me. Uh, the Mercer report works really well in that format. And now I think when people create shows, they create shows with that in mind. Like how, if we're going to do a segment, can it go viral? Can it be put on, on you know, YouTube or what have you? But uh, everything I've ever done has always been short. So it works perfectly. And the rants, you know, rarely go over 90 seconds. Two minutes would be the absolute max. So they're perfectly suited for that. And sure, I find that uh, gratifying to a certain degree. Yeah. Like I mentioned the, the Gord Downey story. Um, I, I was conflicted about that because I wanted to talk about it because it was really just, it was pretty much the only thing on my mind that week. And, uh, and I wanted to tell the story, but at the same time, I was a little worried about how it might be perceived because I didn't want to be seen as, you know, just talking about something because everyone was talking about it. And, and I did it anyway. And I was very, uh, pleased to see that uh, it did so well in social media. Yeah, I certainly like that. I understand that. I think there's there's also a temptation when someone like that passes away who or someone who like that who dies, who you have a connection to, you're always kind of worried about. And I know I found this on the day of like, not making it about myself. You don't want to make it about yourself. Yeah, you know? and yeah. I didn't want to make it like, hey, I'm a friend of Gord's because yeah. the point was I wasn't. I, I mean, we were both in show business in Canada and, and we had done business together on another TV show I did that were that tragically hip provided all the music. Uh, but we were showbiz friends in that way that we had done, but I didn't want to make it like I knew him. But he actually did have this connection with my father that, you know, I felt was very sweet and spoke to the character of the man, and which is why I talked about it. You texted me that day. Yeah. And he, sent you, he, sent, he sent your father that, that, that beautiful, it was, a, it was a, an album cover, right? It's an album cover, yeah. So Gord Downey sent my father the, the original print of, or one of the original prints of that album cover because uh, Gord had called me one time and asked me how to pronounce a town in Newfoundland, and I told him, but then I said a second opinion, mm -hmm. give Dad a call. Unbeknownst to me, Gord did call Dad, and they ended up talking for about an hour. <laughs> and when I said to Dad later, that was Gord Downey, my God, he's the lead singer of the Tragically Hip. Dad said, oh, he never mentioned that. He just said he was Gord from Kingston. <laughs> and uh, so I just thought that that was tremendous. And he always asked, every time I saw Gord, he always asked about my father. So, uh, yeah, that's why I told that story. How do you feel about political satire in Canada right now? 
Well, I think uh, political satire in general is uh, it's a very interesting time because I I always avoided talking about the United States on my current show because I just thought I'm going to cover Canada. Mm -hmm. And I never had a problem with that. In my world, the Kardashians don't exist. And in my world, we never covered Washington. We just covered uh, Canada. It's getting harder to do that because we've never really seen anything like this before. Washington has always been a big force in politics, but now Donald Trump is sucking all of the oxygen out of all of the room mm -hmm. in all quadrants, in, in all areas, like uh, literally like entertainment news and political news and current affairs and international affairs. I mean, he's just taking all of the oxygen. So if you cover political satire, then you have to talk Donald Trump. You're a rare uh, political comedian who's actually made a difference in that. I mean, we talked about this last time we were here, I think oftentimes about when Stockwell Day was 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 running and he was going to he was going to start a petition. If it got a certain amount of if a certain amount of Canadians voted on something or had a petition on something. He had a he had a policy platform that uh, uh, a policy that said if a certain percentage of Canadians signed a petition, there would be a binding referendum. There would be a binding referendum yeah. on it. So yeah, so we we went online. Well we created a website. This was back in the 22 minute days. This was at a time when when I came up with this idea and I said, people will go online and sign a petition. 22 Minutes didn't have a website. Yeah. We didn't even own the domain name. Mm -hmm. You know, shows didn't have domain names. And so we got a million people to sign this petition, and he dropped the policy, and yeah, it had a lot of ramifications. Because you were going to, Stockwell Day was, was to change his name to Doris. To Doris. So can... And under his policy, it would have been the first referendum. <laughs> All Canadians would have spent, you know, $30 million voting on whether or not to change his first name to Doris. But I feel a little bad because it's kind of stuck to him. I think he gets called Doris about twice a week still. The qu reason I ask the question is because I think you look at Jimmy Kimmel and, and Stephen Colbert right now, and there's a question as to whether comedy, whether late-night comedy, whether political satire can actually make a difference. Do you think so? Uh, it's, uh, it's providing comfort to people who are not happy with the state of the world right now. Uh, the argument is, are they just talking to the choir? And if they're just talking to the choir, then maybe it, they're not making as much of a difference as, as they might have hoped. But with social media now, even people who don't necessarily agree with them may click on them yeah. uh, because uh, you know something has generated an, enough of a buzz. But it's very easy now to go through life and just pick and choose where you get your media. Like, I, I have to go out of my way to watch Fox News uh, and check Fox News. And do you do that? I do, yeah, of course. But I have to go out of my way to do it. It's very easy to avoid it. I mean, you could just not ever see it. Why, why is it worth doing? Well, I just, I'm not, I'm not endorsing it. I'm just saying I professionally want to know what they're saying. Yeah. But uh, if, if I don't like Fox News, it's easy not to watch Fox News. Mm -hmm. and, the, and likewise, it's very easy to avoid the New York Times. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very easy to avoid Kimmel if you want to avoid Kimmel. Mm -hmm. So if people have their minds made up, it's, uh, it's hard to reach them because it's very easy for them to find a media source that just uh, reinforces every belief they've ever had. So this is something that obviously that's, that's, that's careful for you. I mean, on your show, you are intentionally not just speaking to the choir. I try not to just speak to the choir. And occasionally you do something and, and people are shocked. They're like, I, how, could you, how could you say that? Because, you know, you're my guy. So mm -hmm. you and I, we're, we see eye to eye on every single subject matter. And then you think, well, no, actually on this one, we don't. And I think that's good. That's healthy. Mm -hmm. And I would like to think that uh, an audience would find that healthy, too. I mean, I think it would be boring if you listen to a political commentator for, you know, week in, week out for years on end and you always agreed with them. That would be that would be tedious. Tell me about tonight's episode. Jan Arden. Yeah. One of the things about our show is we don't have regular guests. But Jan Arden is the exception. She's been on far more than anyone else. Uh, it, it, she makes my life very easy. I have to do very little. I just have to kind of focus her. Uh, she's so funny. We were originally just going to do one segment. It turned into two. I go to the Calgary Zoo with her. There's lemurs. There's you know there's all sorts of like cute cuddly animals that Jan loves. And and her people suggested to me that it would all work out as long as there were no reptiles. And so I arranged for lots of reptiles and snakes <laughs> and and spiders and things like that. And, yeah. And once again, you know, Jan has that that illness that a lot of performers have, things that they would never, ever do in real life. They suddenly find the will to do because there's a camera on. So Jan with snakes. There's lots of screaming. She's one of the funniest women in the country and, and one of my dearest friends. And uh, it's, a, it's a great episode. I'm very pleased with it. And still lots of shows left. 
tons of shows. Tons and tons of shows. What are we talking about? You're not going anywhere. I know. Rick Mercer, thanks for coming in. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll say this. If it wasn't for you and, and, and people like you and, and like Alan Doyle, I, I, I certainly wouldn't be here. Well, that's very nice of you to say. Thank you.